Hey, Fit Pros, before we get to this new episode in the Kips podcast, I want to quickly share about our newest course on Kips, Social Media for Fitness Professionals. This course is all about the fundamentals. As a Fit Pro, you know how fundamental exercises are important for building a foundation within an exercise program, and that's what we're going to be doing in this course. Authored by me, Tyler Valencia. I go through the stats involving all the major social media platforms and then show you step-by-step how to do it. In the first lecture, I built a fictitious business branding kit with a new logo, color wheel, and font. And then we use those to set up new Facebook pages, start a private group, how to use Creator Studio, set up a basic Facebook ad, set up an Instagram, how to post on Instagram, and how to set up a YouTube channel. We do it all in this course, and one of the best parts is you can get your continuing education credits. Head to the link in the description to find out more. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Kips Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia. I'm the president of Kips and Time to Train Fitness. We have a topic that I've been excited to talk about. I've been thinking about it in the back of my head because of as you grow in this industry, you grow in the fitness industry, you start to experience new things and your outlook starts to change. You start to see things. And we're going to be talking about instructor inequalities within the fitness fitness industry. There we go. And we have guest Kate Finnamore on the podcast. Kate, thank you for coming on. Happy to be here. Let's set the stage. Kate, can you give a description of your background, what you're doing in the industry, how you started, all that kind of great stuff? Sure. Um, I actually have a master's degree in counseling. um, And uh, long ago, before I had that, I started off as a, and I'm using air quotes, aerobics instructor when I was Mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've held uh, probably more than 20 different fitness certifications. And I've been in the business close to 30 years now. Um, So I've been both a location specific group fitness manager, as well as a a regional group fitness manager. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done that in big name gym companies that everyone would know, a uh, smaller gym chains and boutiques. And um, I've even interviewed for multiple national director type positions. But honestly, um, and again, if you're worried about being controversial, I've been ashamed, like embarrassed of the offers that come with those positions. Yeah. And so I've never taken one. Um, and then in April 2020, as we all know, everything changed. And uh, I actually ended up founding and I direct um, an online fitness company called mm-hmm. Engage Fitness Collective. Mm-hmm. And we offer members unlimited access to a variety of classes. Um, we have about 90 maybe a little more than 90 weekly online classes uh, for one low monthly membership fee, just like you would get if you belong to a brick and mortar gym. Mm -hmm. And we also, on the flip side, offer instructor support to start or to grow their own online businesses, fitness businesses, because we collaborate as a team. And it's it's real hard to go it out, go it alone out there. So um, in a traditional model, uh, a member would pay a gym and the gym would pay instructors. In our model, members pay their own instructor directly mm. for their e- engaged membership. And we all work together to facilitate a schedule that gives everybody more um, for their members to take without having to work any harder. So we want instructors to have leverage so that when they especially during COVID when things started to open up and they had an offer to go back and teach in person that they would have um, some experience to be able to say, well, this is what I'm making. Can you match that? Yeah. Rather than just having to claw back, like, oh, please give me back my class. <laughs> um, so now we have 22 instructors across lots of different time zones and we nice. have approximately 250 members. Awesome. Awesome. What you just mentioned with your model, with paying the instructor, and not so, and not to go too much into the leverage part, because we're going to come back to that later on. But something came in my head because just before we started recording, I did a quick scan through Facebook. Didn't really go too much into stuff, but I saw a post that reminded me of something you mentioned with uh, with your model. It really sounds like you want the instructor to be set up for success with helping them with their with their setup, creating their own online business, all things that. I feel like anybody would want, anybody would want that, that you want to do that. And as a business owner, I share a very common uh, outlook on that because if your instructors are successful, that will all pay, pay out. It will all pay back up. It'll, your business will grow. People will be happy. They'll be happy. Their con, their workouts that they create 
will be better. All things that it's, it sounds fantastic. And yet we work in an industry where we have these great intentions. We want to help people. But oftentimes we get put in these situations where you start regretting things. You start <laughs> thinking, oh, uh, I, I'm not creating the workouts that I used to because that passion has left. And something to come back to that Facebook post that I want to get your feedback on because it's uh, it's very relevant in my opinion to what you just mentioned, what we're talking about now was in this post, somebody shared in, I, it was one of the cycling instructor Facebook groups that I'm in, despite not being a cycling instructor, <laughs> but <laughs> with it, this showed a picture of an, uh, a sign that said, uh, our Peloton bikes are now in. And somebody was asking, what do you think about this? How do you think, what do, what do instru fellow instructors think about this? That this gym that I teach at is now adding Peloton bikes to their, uh, to their gym floor. And in my opinion, when I first saw it, and I didn't comment this, but I just thought that goes exactly against setting up your instructors for success. It goes against it. And yet the gyms wanted people to come back immediately. They didn't want to change their models and didn't want to pay them better. They just wanted to go back to how <laughs> things were. And so I want to get your, uh, your response to that with this post that I saw and what, because your outlook's very similar to mine. What do you think about that? Well, I'd first like to say that you 100% hit the nail on the head on gyms just want everything to go back to the way it was without making any changes at all. I will, yeah. I, 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 you couldn't be more right about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I I have mixed feelings about Peloton, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Here's what I think. I think they do a great job. They make a, they make a wonderful package and I completely understand why it appeals to people. Yeah. Um, and so when a gym puts some Peloton bikes on their floor, I can see why they think that has value, mm -hmm. why they think that that will help them um, with their market. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely have days where I see that as a direct conflict for a group fitness instructor. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, the truth of it is, is that a Peloton instructor at best can call out, hey, TV 205, happy 100th class. Like, <laughs> that's the best they can do. Mm -hmm. And I can actually say, hey, Tyler, can you widen your stance on your lunge there, please? Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have a better base of support. Yeah. And the bottom line is, is that one has more value than the other. And yeah. so I don't worry too much about Peloton taking over my world. Um, yep. I, it's clearly a um, a factor. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend it's not. <laughs> um, but in the end, I would rather spend my energy figuring out how I can do what I do better and better and better to make sure that I still have value and that instructors like myself still have value. Yeah. I like that. I like that. It's, um, I'll say again, very similar. I don't worry too much about what, uh, other instructors, other companies are doing because it, um, it takes away from the creative aspects of what I want to do. And along those same lines, I will say that I have <laughs> friends that at first, of course, they wanted to get their Peloton and now they're going away for it for similar reasons that you just said, that they can't give, at the most that they can give is just a little shout out there. But that connection, that connection with online workouts or even uh, the type of online workouts that you can create for yourself, for your clients, for members, and that you can, the communities that you can create through online workouts, you can do so much as a instructor yourself. And I think it's hard to see that sometimes because we don't have the information, the education out there for it with my company, Time to Train Fitness. It's a YouTube business, but yet we, we're starting to see all those things, but I'm getting away too, too far for what we <laughs> want to talk about here. But uh, that tangent came up and I had to, I had to throw it out there. So let's get back to what we're here to really talk about with the inequalities, because it's something that, I mean, I'm going on, I think it's year 13. I always have to, I feel like in my bio, sometimes it says 10 and I'm just like, has it only been 10? I feel like it's like 13, 14, but I've been in the industry about 13 plus years, we'll say. And you start to see these after a year, year and a half, I feel like the inequalities. How do you feel like instructor inequalities have changed over the years, last 10 years, 15 years? I feel like it's almost sometimes it's nine days, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. What is your opinion on those? Uh, okay. So that's a long one. 
<laughs> no, yeah. The problem is I can get quite passionate about this and, oh, yeah. and I can really go on and on far farther than anyone ever wanted when they asked me the question to begin with. So mm-hmm. um, I'll start by saying they've always been there, right? The, in- yeah. the inequalities have always been there. I think COVID shined a big bright light in the dark corners um, for most of us, not all of us, but for most of us. And so, um, okay, I've been around a long time. 30 years is a long time. So in the beginning, I would say the inequalities were more gender biased, if you will, because I came up in like what I would consider like the heyday of group fitness um, you know, jazzercise aerobics, I'm using air quotes for all of these things <laughs> were, um, trendy and they were, um, things that people expected that women in a gym wanted to do because, um, as you've covered with multiple guests on this podcast before, no one ever believed that women would want to lift weight, it might get big, <laughs> right? So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to dance around and, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it, but it was in, it was in the heyday. And so, in some ways, what I did had a little got a little more respect because it was I'm going to use the word trendy, mm-hmm. um, but in a lot of ways, very disrespected because it was mostly women dominated. And um, as I know, you know, because you've worked in gyms, um, things have clearly gotten better. But mm-hmm. um, the the level of daily harassment, I mean, hourly harassment in a gym in the 1990s was astounding. I mean, I really, I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it, but when I think about it, it, it literally was my all day every day because I was in management. So I worked, you know, full time. I was there all the time and in, in workout clothes, 90% of the time. And literally it was all day, every day. And it was just normal. It, mm. I mean, I'm, I'm sad to say, but it was just normal. So in that way, that inequality has gotten a little better. People are a little more politically correct for whatever, if they believe it or not, they maybe keep their, maybe they think it, but they don't say it or mm-hmm. whatever. So that part has changed a little bit for the better. Yeah. But in terms of the way that fitness professionals are treated on the job, hmm. I actually think, think it's gotten worse to Mm. be honest. And I really choose my words carefully when I say fitness professional, because I feel that most people think if you work in a gym, that you're not a professional. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people out there and maybe including the people who own gyms think that the people who work for them are just laborers. Like we're right. Like we're just going to show up and we're going to sweat because that's what we do. We're going to work hard and we don't deserve benefits and we don't deserve um, to be evaluated properly. We don't deserve, deserve to be um, led or upskilled or managed or given any sort of a progress or process to, um, to rise and to learn new skills and to progress on a career path of any kind. And I actually feel like that's actually gotten worse and worse over the years, not better. Um, example, uh, my first group fitness management job was in, oh, I'm with you. I have trouble with you. I mean, it was a long time ago, <laughs> 1994, mm-hmm. five, maybe. Mm-hmm. And back then that job was very much seen as like a part-time job that like, uh, somebody who already had a full-time job might take or a, or a housewife. Mm-hmm. And again, I just air quotes, a housewife might take. Um, so it wasn't treated with a lot of respect. But it was like, you know, you were paid, I don't know, 15 bucks an hour for 15 hours a week to basically put out fires, right? To make sure instructors showed up or to hang a sign if something wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Um, And that job, I saw that job morph into a slightly more professional job. So in my experience, that job became a job where you could get a full-time position and maybe you would run two gyms. Like maybe you would have two locations that were owned by the same people and you would run the group fitness programs in those two gyms. And that would be a full-time job and it might come with benefits and you would be expected to work a full-time schedule and you had management responsibilities and it was treated more like a career. And, and that seemed to have reversed itself in the two thousands. So there was a point at which I was running two gyms as a full-time group fitness manager. And that job became, if I wanted to keep the job with no increase in compensation, that job became a three gym job and then a four gym job. 
And then I demoted myself and got out of that job because I could see the writing on the wall. There was no career path. Mm -hmm. And I watched the people who came up after me that became a six gym job, a 10 gym job, a 16 gym (sighs) job, a job across (laughs) multiple states. Um, I have now worked in a gym as an instructor where I've worked for six years in the same gym and had, I'm sorry, within five years had six different group fitness managers who never once lived in the state where my gym was located. So I maybe <laughs> How's that met possible? one of them once. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not gotten better. It's gotten worse. And for instructors, you have to imagine if that's what the management position is, well, then obviously the people who report to that manager, their lot in life isn't going to get any better. Mm-hmm. Like the, the pay in 1996, I hired instructors at $16 an hour, $17 an hour in 2016, I was expected to be able to hire instructors in the same market. I did not move for 16 or $17 an hour. (laughs) That's not okay. That's not, that's not. And you know, I I don't know, you're not as old as I am, but you know that the qualification requirements have considerably increased. Yep over those years. So the Mm. amount of time and money we're supposed to lay out to be a qualified instructor, I have no problem with that. I want people to be good at their jobs, but I Mm. want them to be compensated for that time and that education. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go back here to the, about about the perception, uh, because I feel like that's one that um, it's an interesting area to go into. I will say that friends, family, they think that just because I work in the fitness industry, that I'm just a trainer. And if I provide a tip or even my favorite is when somebody will sit, will send me some, oh, this person, I'm going to send you this, this contact when I don't know what I would do with it. Like it's somebody that just works in the industry. I don't, what does that mean? Like, we, uh, what can I do with this? Like, the, it makes me kind of wonder, do people really understand what I do that, that, that there's more than just being a, an instructor in the fitness industry? There's so much more, but yet the perception is you just create workouts for people. That's what you do. You just, you just teach people. They don't understand that this is a professional industry. There's so many pieces that go into it. And that's the perception that I feel like some, sometimes we have to to fight that. We have to to fight that to show that this is a a growing industry. This is one that's professional, that people can create businesses, careers out of them. And, you know, I'm not sure how we address that because, I mean, sometimes it's it's changing what our quote unquote title is. I feel like just a couple of weeks ago, I was saying, okay, what do I consider myself? And first I was like, am I a fitness entrepreneur? But really, I don't really like the term, the term entrepreneur. Yeah. I like the term uh, creator, content creator, because I create a lot of content. And what is your thoughts on that? What is your thoughts on the perception of uh, our industry uh, in terms of how can we change that? How can we change how people look at what we do, how we try to help people? What I try to tell people all the time, anyone who will listen, I say to people, I clearly am not a neurosurgeon. Like I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't go into a surgical room and cut someone's brain open. Mm -hmm. I do not do heart surgery. Um, I don't, I don't, that's not what I do, but I believe wholeheartedly and anybody can think this is as cheesy as they want it to be. I believe wholeheartedly that fitness professionals save people's lives. We save people's lives on a daily basis and not the way people think, right? They think like, oh, you make them fitter so they don't have a heart attack. Mental health is an epidemic in this Mm -hmm. country. And I will spend my last dying breath going to bat for the fact that when you move, you feel better. And if you can move with other people, if, if you do it with a trainer, if you do it with a buddy, if you do it in a class, it makes an enormous amount of difference about how you perceive yourself, yourself in the world, the world. And I think that fitness professionals literally, not figuratively, literally save people's lives. Yeah. I, I don't know how to say it any more plainly. <laughs> no, I agree a hundred percent. And it's, it's sometimes unfortunate that it takes um, a life threatening situation for somebody to realize that, that sometimes people have to go through something 
uh, I'm talking about people outside the fitness industry, if they go through something to realize, oh, wow, health, my health is really dependent on exercise. I do need to move more. I do need to exercise. And it's, I don't even know the answer to fix that. I think I feel like I brought that up before in a podcast episode. I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to address that. I know I brought it up in a lecture before recently at the beginning of August was how do we uh, get to people quicker than that? Because we often only see them after they've had that surgery or after they've had that life-threatening issue happen to them that oh, I, the doctor told me, but I, I realized that I should have been doing this years ago. It's like, well, how do we get to them quicker? And I don't know the answer to that. And it's it's a tough one. Uh, one of the pieces that I do want to go back to again, because <laughs> again, so much in the back in this yeah. is with the management aspects of it, with how you mentioned when you first started going into management and yet you're your responsibilities expanded and yet they wanted you to do more work, same pay. And yet that just grew and grew and grew. I feel like that is something that recently my wife was talking about and the, the term I'm, the, I'm, trying, I'm drawing a blank on what it's called. I might be like called like quiet quitting, but really it's about oh, yeah. uh, it, when she expanded on it, she read, read out loud what, what it was about. And it was about talking about your responsibilities, your roles, all these kinds of things. And with this, I, I broke it down to her what I thought. And I just said that I feel like oftentimes when you are a manager or you are put in that position, your roles start to expand, but upper management, they don't compensate. They just expect, oh, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep growing, keep doing this, but they don't communicate it well. I feel like management, upper management has that issue in terms of they don't want to teach their people. They don't want to uh, compensate their people for those for what the work they're doing, despite it being a necessity. And so when you started going into management, and so you're looking at it, you're looking at all these things out there for you, and you're seeing that there's no upward mobility for you. It's not going to get any better. Do you feel like the conversations to making it improve, do you think those were out there for you? I tried. I really mm-hmm. did. So in the gym setting, in a gym setting, the, the, Barrier I come across all the time is that very often you've got a, per, a personal training department and a group fitness department, mm-hmm. and the I and the 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 general thought is that the personal training department makes money, the mm-hmm. group fitness department does not make money. That's <laughs> that is generally the thought. Now that's set up for two in two ways, right? It's set up because most gym memberships include classes free. And again, I'm, I'm using air quotes free mm-hmm. of charge. They are included in your membership. So people in the gym industry see that as basically a drain on their budget rather than something that can make them money. And I, um, I have two problems with that line of thought. The first problem with that line of thought is, is that if you run a group fitness department, well, you should be able to monetize it. And there are many, many different ways that you can do that. And I have written lengthy, lengthy proposals to do such things at multiple <laughs> large name, named gym chains that everybody who's listening to this podcast would know. Mm-hmm. And, and no one listens. Mm-hmm. No one listens. I have sat at boardroom meetings with large tables of management type characters and and had these kinds of conversations where I'll say, I, uh, I'd like to add a class on Wednesdays at 930. I have a great instructor available. We're going to add this class. And they, you know, look at the printout and they say, oh, um, there aren't enough check-ins that, to, to, to necessitate a class there. And I say, well, there aren't check-ins because there isn't a class. Mm-hmm. And they say, that's not how it works. And I say, <laughs> I'm the expert. You hired me to run this department. I'm telling you, that's exactly how it works. Uh-huh. I try have tried to explain to multiple levels of management that there are plenty of people who belong to that gym who walk in, they swipe at the front desk, they go straight to the group fitness room, they yep. take their class and they walk straight back out to their car. They yep. may never they might not have even seen the inside of the locker room. They never get a piece of equipment. They don't buy a smoothie. They literally <laughs> walk in, take class, and leave. And I, I'm not kidding you. It's so, it's so disheartening to me how many times I've had 
somebody above me go, that's not true. And I'm like, it's, I see it every day. It's a hundred percent true. Um, I've had people in my class say to me, I'm sorry, where's the water fountain? And I'm like, you've been a member here for six years. And they're like, I know, I just always bring my own water bottle and it's full. I've never had to, like, they don't, that this is the only reason they're there. And yes. if I, as your group fitness manager, do a good job of that, there will be a million ways for you to monetize that. There will be a million ways. If you just invest and you yep. listen to our ideas and you let me build you a staff of instructors who are excellent at their craft. Okay. And the second um, point that I want to make about um, management compensation, compensation and not seeing a path as a group fitness manager is that, again, if you don't think the group fitness department makes money, if you don't think that it um it has an actual column in your spreadsheet, in your return on investment. <laughs> um, I don't understand why you can't at least see that the power of retention in every business, we all know that it is much cheaper to keep a customer than it is to go out and get a new one. And if there is nothing else, if you don't believe for one second that group fitness can be monetized in any other way, you have to agree that it is the biggest and best retention tool that you can possibly have. Because I don't know a single person who ever like kept their gym membership because treadmill number nine was just the most <laughs> amazing treadmill they've ever run in, run on. And they never went home and told their neighbor or their sister, oh my gosh, you have to come run on treadmill number nine. Mm -hmm. But no, group fitness, that's what we do. We have people who say, I, I don't think I... I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my Friday afternoon yoga class or they tell their friend or their neighbor, like the Zumba class on Tuesday nights. It's amazing. You have to come, you have to come see this instructor and hear her playlist. It's amazing. Yep. Like that's what we do. Let us do what we do well, and we will help you <laughs> grow your business. <laughs> yep. I, it's, uh, I mean, there's two points that I'm going to go off of here because they're both very relevant with it. And one, the last gym that I worked in, but then also one of the gyms that I consult for, once group fitness improved, the gym improved. And the gym that I consult for out here in Arizona, once a general manager came and really took time to build the schedule for group fitness, all of a sudden, the membership started to double. More people were coming in. The gym was filled. And all of a sudden, people started seeing that there's actually people that go to this gym after years of being open. And you just point to group fitness. I believe, um, I don't even know the statistic on it, but I know it's a very large percentage of people that sign up for gyms strictly for the group fitness schedule. And I wish I knew that percentage off my head, but it's one of those things where you hear, you're like, okay, yeah, we. if I was to hear that, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to go spend some time building the schedule out more because if this is what people are coming for, we, sh we need to make sure that our oh, instructors have the support. Go ahead. It's basic math. Like yeah. it costs you a lot less to pay an instructor for an entire <laughs> year than it does to buy a treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it can't dumb. make too much sense sometimes. It can't make too much sense. I've ever realized that. That's true. <laughs> yes. And, you know, along those same lines, if I was running a gym, and I'm looking at the last couple of years. One of the big things that uh, I'll say we realized, oh, wow, people at home like to do group exercise, group fitness classes. It's technically, I don't know if it's considered group fitness classes, but working out from home, it's almost a group um, mentality from the people creating them. They're still creating them from, from bigger sizes of uh, populations. Wouldn't you want to create something at at your gym where you improve the experience, you do things that you support your instructors, you create workout classes that are going to attract new members, do things that support them, all things that kind of the underlying theme that so far we've talked about so far in this episode, supporting your staff in ways that helps them grow, that helps them build because it's going to come back to you. And so it's one of those things where, again, just makes too much sense. And it kind of leads me to my next question with, uh, we've kind of, kind of talked about it already with the, you have had these conversations or you've tried to have these conversations and nobody has listened to them. What are maybe some circumstances that you feel like instructors should stand up for themselves, should say, Hey, you know, can I have a sit down about this and maybe in touch on the, the approach for it? Oh, so very many things. I mean, let's start with the obvious and the obvious is wages. Um, mm -hmm. Instructors, so typically a group fitness instructor 
doesn't make a living being a group fitness instructor. So you have two types. You have the person who already has a full-time job and that job is where they, you know, pay their mortgage and put food on their table. Mm -hmm. And that's also probably where they have their benefits. And so they are not so worried about their wages. They're like, oh, you know, it's nice if I break even or, you know, if I make a little extra money, it's my side hustle. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to be as likely to sit down with someone and say, hey, I deserve a raise because they are typically um, more focused on their day job, if you will. Yeah. I call it their grown up job because I, people people like to consider what we do like not their grown up job. So <laughs> um, there's that piece of it. But then there's also what I call the hobbyists. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are people who they see their group fitness path as more of a hobby than a career, than a than a profession. And so they they just don't think it's important to sit down and say, hey, I've been here a year. Could I have an evaluation? Mm -hmm. Could I am I eligible for a raise? Hey, I've been here two years or. And this is the this is the problem I ran into very often as a as a manager is that I would do those yearly evaluations and I would be told, oh, I'm sorry, we've frozen all increases. We you can't give anyone an increase. And so then what is the incentive for my instructors to continue to get more certifications, to upskill, to grow their classes, to do all the things that I'm asking them to do to be better at their craft and to help build um, a, a solid business for this gym, for this company. And, and, you know, it always comes off. It's I'm always told, oh, it's it's temporary. But that temporary wage freeze has gone on. And again, these are big name gyms. I am not talking about mom and pops mm -hmm. for three years, five years, seven years. I mean, I have been in situations where I have not been allowed to give a single instructor a raise for year after year after year mm. after year. And it's just, so it, it it's unfair. It's unprofessional. It's disrespectful. I could go on and on, but to me, that's the number one thing that I need instructors to understand that they deserve and that they have every right to stand up and say, oh, um, no, like I, I deserve an evaluation. And if that evaluation is positive, then I deserve an increase. Mm -hmm. So I would say wages are number one. Um, and then piggybacking on that, being paid for our time. So a lot of people think, well, you know, you get paid for the hour that you're here teaching class and that that, then, you know, whatever that number is, let's say I threw out earlier that I was hiring instructors at $17 an hour, like $17 an hour for an hour is not, it's not terrible money, right? In some States, I mean, where I live, it's double the minimum wage, um, but the point is, is that it's just like training a client. You don't just show up and make it up off the top of your head. There's preparation that goes into that hour of, of class time. And then we all know you don't just walk in and the, and you're ready to go. There's, you get there early, you set up the room, you check the sound system, you greet people. And then at the end, there are people who have questions for you, who want help with things. And that is all considered uncompensated time. Like you're not you're not expected to be paid. You don't expect to be paid for that. And if you ask, you're treated like, <laughs> how, how dare you ask to be paid for that? I mean, it really is quite unfortunate. And, and we're trained really early on to, to stop standing up for ourselves, to just sort of expect that this is status quo. And if you don't like it, I'll just go hire the next girl who gets certified. Like, mm -hmm. there's, you know, don't worry about it. There's 10 more where you came from. Um, so wages... The and and how those wages are applied to our duties, and then of course COVID brought in a whole nother level um, of things that maybe the average person doesn't know, but I think people in the fitness industry understand. We are expected to teach classes and train clients when we don't feel well, mm -hmm. when we are injured, when we have family emergencies, um, and group fitness instructors are expected to teach when the microphone doesn't work, when the air conditioning doesn't work, mm -hmm. when there's, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Like, I think people will think I'm being dramatic. I have taught with water flowing freely from the ceiling of the room I'm in. I have taught on floors that had buckled because oh, of that kind of thing. And we're taught, we're literally, you're putting down like a bench and it's, it's not, it doesn't sit flat because the floor isn't flat. 
I've taught in rooms that were upwards of 90 degrees with 100% humidity, just insane HVAC Ooh. problems. I've taught with no working microphone. I've taught with no working stereo. Um, and these are not unusual circumstances. Like if you ask any group fitness instructor, if they've been teaching more for, th- for more than two weeks, they've probably encountered this. <laughs> this is regular. This is mm-hmm. usual. This is common. And it is atrocious way, an atrocious way to treat your employees. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go back to the, the wages one because that's one where I've had conversations with other fit pros about this one. And it's one where, I mean, I, both of us are, are business owners. And I think that our experiences having been instructors, it goes to a point where you want to make sure that your instructors feel compensated, that feel that they, uh, we appreciate the work that they do having gone through these. And so the last time a, a fellow instructor, that's a manager asked me about this and mentioned almost word for word, the same things that you mentioned about uh, the non-clocked in work. And I have worked for a gym before, and I don't know if this is a solution or this is even part of the solution, but I remember we had to clock in and clock out. And so technically the time that we took, of course, they tried to say, okay, make sure that you clock in right before you, the minute before, no minute after, or you can't <laughs> clock in five minutes before to get that extra five minutes. It's like, well, you expect us to swipe our our clock in card and then sprint over to the class to teach it i mean that yeah. is that, that, <laughs> that is, is what they, exactly yeah, they that expect. is what they expect. But, <laughs> <That> is, <yep. laughs> but i mean that's potentially one way to solve it there i uh one of the responses that i gave that i don't think i fully believe it but i uh i could i could say i could see it from a business standpoint just being a business owner being a in that position that uh if hopefully you're when you said how much we're talking about 17 and and working in those conditions i'm like hopefully not many instructors are in that position but i feel like there are a lot oh, so many and i feel like as if you are compensated well over i mean i've worked in positions where i've been in the 30s 40s uh, per hour and thankful for those but uh you know with those i myself and this is how I explained it, was that I am getting paid over the typical um, hourly wage. And just how you explain it, though, because I guess I, I will say it that I guess I'm, I was conditioned for it, that there's no other tasks, creating your programs, all that kind of stuff. You're just conditioned to believe that's part of it. Mm-hmm. And um, it's unfortunate for that. I don't know the solution for that. I, do, well, I really don't. Go ahead. It's gotten even worse because now we're also expected to be our own marketing team. So now we're expected to spend time on Instagram or on Facebook or on Twitter saying, oh, look at my playlist for tonight. Doesn't that look fun? Who wants to come to class? Oh, I've got a guest pass. If you're, you know, we're expected to do that. I've actually seen managers like complain online about how they're, you know, oh, this instructor, her class wasn't well attended. And she got mad when I took it off the schedule because she said I, I didn't do anything to market it. But that's not my job. That's her job. And I responded, well, were you paying her for that? Like Hmm. she have, do you set aside a couple of hours a week where instructors are paid to create their own social media posts and post them? Like, and they were like, no, that's part of the job. And I'm like, it shouldn't be. (laughs) I don't know why you, like, you keep expanding what you want people to do for free. And it. You, You bring up a really good point here. And that was actually one that I wanted to talk about because of how do we then equip our instructors, I will say, because that is one of the big things. I started off in the education side. I, of course, I, I taught before that, but I started in the education side early on in my career. And the business fundamentals was always something that the first company I worked for, they weren't. Um, that was what the company became known for. And as you get into this industry, you realize, oh, wow, well, they didn't really teach us much about growing your own business. They don't teach us how we can grow our client list. They really just taught us 20 pages of anatomy, 20 pages of physiology, and said, here's this template that you can work off of. But the business fundamentals is what, you know, really helps you grow. And now we've seen social media, the uh, the the importance of it. And uh, f- from, I'll say myself, owning a business, time to train where we have instructors, I always say that I don't 
I tell them right off the bat that I don't expect you to promote your classes. Of course, it's greatly appreciated. It helps big time if you want help. Um, but I, I do see it as a um, the instructors that do. You're like, oh, wow, like, thank you. Like, I really do appreciate it. And you do see the differences. But again, from the gym side, they don't give you those skills. I will say the overwhelming majority of fitness pros do not know how to use social media and use a phone, use a computer, uh, because we're not taught, you're not expected to know. You, you're never given the skill set to do that. So you, you can't really punish them for not knowing, for not doing it. They're not what a part of being in the fitness industry says, okay, you need to lo- learn the differences between a Mac and a Windows based computer. You need to learn how to use an iPhone or an Android phone. There's None of that's in your education. None of that's part of your training, and yet you're being expected to know it. And so that's always my my uh, other side of it is that you're not giving people the skills to know those things. And then the flip side of that, you're not compensating it for it. Uh, what can be the response as, as an instructor to a manager? Hey, like if you want me to do these things, here's what, can we work this out? What, how would you approach that? Honestly, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm close to 30 years in COVID has now happened and we'll call it reseeded. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think I'll say it went away, but it has reseeded. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't mean to sound like a negative, you know, uh, conspiracy mm-hmm. theorist, but my <laughs> guess is that won't be the last time in my lifetime that something like this happens where we're all, you know, our, our world is shook and, and we are forced to, to look at everything differently. Mm -hmm. And to me, it goes back to the point you made very much when we started that gyms expected that everything would just go back to normal. So what I feel like I have to counsel instructors to do what I want to counsel instructors to do is be better than the gyms. Like you have to expect that things will not go back to normal and you have to be, you have to think about a way that you can advocate for yourself even if the gyms do go back to normal. So my, at this point, I would highly recommend that any instructor, any personal trainer, anybody who is a fitness professional who wants to succeed moving forward has to think of ways to do that that are independent from a particular brick and mortar location where they are an employee. Because in if it hasn't changed in 30 years, I can't, it's not, it wouldn't make sense for me to sit here and say, well, I expect the next 30 years to be better. Well, why would they? Why, mm-hmm. why, if I haven't seen a change with COVID and I haven't, if that didn't force gym owners to say, ooh, we, we ought to have an online fitness presence where we use these great instructors we have to create <laughs> online classes that we could stream through our platform. That hasn't happened in most <laughs> cases. I'm not saying there aren't, there's some really mm-hmm. forward thinking gym owner, owners out there who've embraced it. But for generally speaking, you don't see big platforms from the big name gym chains. Mm-hmm. It hasn't changed for them to say, oh, you know what? It's get it's really hard for us to bring get members to come back to the gym right now. Like we're having a really hard time getting our members back. Hmm, what might work? Oh, let's see. I paid one person a wage for one hour and she used to put 50 people in the room. Maybe if I asked her to come back and I offered her a raise she would come back and then those people would come back. Nope, that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the instructors I know who are going back are going back at pay cuts. They're Mm -hmm. actually agreeing to go back for less money rather than more. And so I have to say to instructors, now is the time to advocate for yourself. And if that gym doesn't want to pay you what you think you're worth, don't go back. Like find a place where you can rent space Find a a way that you can teach from home, that you can use an online platform. There are so many more opportunities now to teach in in what I would have called non-traditional ways. Do not be afraid to explore those. And I say this as one of the older people in this industry (laughs) who should, I should be the person going like, oh, I don't know, uh, it seems scary. Mm -hmm. And, And it did, it did seem scary. And I understand that if you do this as a hobbyist, or if you do this because you are, you know, as a side hustle, that the idea of having to create an online platform or a brand or all of that, it seems so overwhelming. And if you just show up at XYZ gym and 10 people show up and you just get to teach your class, which is the part you're good at, right? Like none of us want to do all the extra work of the things we're not good at. My skills, just like you said, nobody taught me any of these things. Like I was taught how to do, 
how to teach a great class in a room, how to communicate with people, how to cue people, you know, visually, auditorially, how to give people direction, instruction, how to, those are the things that I'm good at. I've spent a whole career being good at. I was, I'm not good at pick, you know, creating a graphic, designing a logo Mm -hmm. and using all the social media platforms. And I'm, I'm really happy to see online educators like your programs. You have some, I know out there where we can learn these skills, where fitness professionals can learn these skills and, and hopefully get continuing education credits for it. Mm -hmm. But I, I would highly recommend anybody who's in the fitness profession now to be thinking forward. Don't be thinking like these big box gyms. They are, I don't know how they're staying standing. They are so stagnant. It is a business model that is broken and we have to stop feeding into it. We're giving these stagnant business models, our skills to help keep them afloat when we could be building our own businesses. And again, personal trainers, group fitness instructors, we could be building our own profitable, successful community serving businesses Yep. that are doing all the things that we want to do without the middleman. I don't need someone to pay a gym so that the gym can pay me. What I have learned during COVID is that people will pay me and I'm not going back. <laughs> yep. Yep. One piece to add in there, when you say community, that community could be global. And yes. <laughs> it could be huge. And those are things that I feel like when you start off, and I know that instructors, whenever they think about the online parts of running a business, they get scared. There's a, a ton of tools out there. And I'm someone that my all my education is an exercise science, but I can do a lot of stuff with a computer, some fancy things. And I think it's a mindset, of, of course, it's scary, uh, but there are so many resources out there, not just with fitness education companies, but free education too. There's so much on YouTube that you can learn step-by-step step how to do things. And I will share a quick story of the way that I first started KIPS. I followed a tutorial on how to build a online learning management system. Of course, things have exponentially grown from there. And sure. I've, I've done it a lot more than that, but I followed a step-by-step. Step. It was like 16 different videos that I had to follow, but that's how I got started with it. And it, it's there's the reason I bring that up is, is there's, there's so much out there. That, of course, the time aspect with people growing their families, growing their careers, that you got to find those pieces, but it's definitely out there. It's definitely out there. And I am in that boat with you that the instructors need to take back that power that they have because I've seen it firsthand. The power of a good instructor, you you can't ever replace somebody like that. A good instructor that is doing it for, I don't want to say the right reasons, but they're in it for the right reasons, to help others, that has that personality, that does all the small things that good professional instructors do. It's hard to, to find someone else like that. Those those are not just overwhelmingly coming to everybody, coming to gyms, walking around. It's one of those things where you feel fortunate when you meet somebody like that, that wants to help, that wants to grow, all those things. So it, I... Really hope that instructors listening to this hear that positive support that Kate is bringing because it's true. I, I really do believe in it. Um, it's I don't know how else to to say that because it's something that <laughs> I know I'm picking my words here as I'm trying to think of what to say. <laughs> but with gyms, I don't know, it's tough. I, I've, I have friends that are directors of education, have been directors of education, and to hear how much budgets get get cut for education, for support, for helping build teams. You know, those are usually the first things. They are the first things that get cut is the education, that the support that helps you grow your career. Yeah. Those are always the first things that get cut. And I'm yeah. talking about big gyms, big gym chains that uh, well, that people work for. And <laughs> You and don't yet, have to convince me. I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yet they will tell me again. They'll tell, say the same thing. I will, I'm just reiterating here that they will say the same thing that, they did not, these directors of education will say that they did not change their, their business plan. They did not. And that's where I think people listening that just know that gyms, they're, I, I was about to say five, they're 10, 15 years behind what's what's out there right now. And I would, go ahead. I would really like to think that maybe, just maybe, if enough of us harnessed that power that we have and we, and we, sh- we could show the gyms 
how to do it. And so then you'd have two choices, right? You could, you could in the future still choose to go out on your own, but maybe if we all put ourselves in positions where they need us more than we need them, it would force their hands. And I honestly believe that the power of that comes in numbers, right? Like I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. However many people are listening to this podcast, they, you know, you tell a friend and you tell a friend, but like we have to band together and say, maybe if we all stand up for ourselves and we all learn these skills and see how they can be put into action successfully, the gyms will have to turn around and go, you know, I can't get an instructor to come teach because they're all, they're making more money doing X, Y, Z. I'm going to have to up my game. Like we're as a corporate culture, we're going to have to up our game. I would like nothing more. That would make me so happy. Yeah. I I will say word for word, a director of education (laughs) had said that, that that's a position that he was in. I guess should have said he, but (laughs) that that was a position that they were in. There we go. Mm -hmm. As a gym that, that they, he, he didn't know how to get them to come back. How, yeah. how do I get instructors to come back? And they were stumped. How do, what are, what are the steps moving forward? And uh, it, I think it's tough, to be honest. I think that um, when we were getting closer to things, opening up more, and I can just speak from where I live out in Arizona, that some of that power, I feel like, escaped when some fit pros I don't want to say they turned it political, but they started saying, oh, we need live. We need live and stuff. And then all of a sudden people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to go back to live. And you kind of just gave back all the power yeah. uh, in terms of what. And I, I don't want to make it political in terms of that, that turn that the podcast that way. But they really pushed for live to come back when there was so much great stuff happening. I, I could not tell you how many stories I heard of instructors just crushing it with online, crushing it mm-hmm. and growing their careers and how happy they were and mm-hmm. all these kinds of things. And I just, I would get goosebumps with it because they took those steps. They really, I need to survive. I need to grow during this time. I can't just sit down. And those were really great stories. But uh, I mean, the whole push for live, but then going back to the, right back to where things were with gyms and the inequalities. That's, that's the tough part of it. And I don't know, um, you know, how that works with it, but, um, you know, to kind of get back to one of the other topics that with the power, with going online, all these kinds of things and the instructor support and even pay with it, it goes with, I feel like the education part of it. And this is kind of be one of the last areas I will touch on. And I think we'll have to set up a, a second part of this ep- <laughs> of this topic because I'll tell you th- the listeners right now that this is probably half of what was probably planned to talk about, mm. uh, but it's, it's just such a great topic for people to hear, to learn more about. And with education for instructors out there. And I mean, education, I'll say instructors are typically, or I've seen both sides of it, but they've, I've seen instructors have to go pay for their own certifications if they want to get a pay raise or if they want to stay in this, they have to go pay. Some gyms will comp- recompensate. And that's one of the things where I feel like there, we see some improvements on it, but uh, it goes with the training, with social media, with getting a new certification, to hopefully bring more people. How, what is your outlook on education and the gym part of it? Should they be paying for certifications, especially certification continue ed? So I like to try to compare it to any job, right? Like if I had an, a, a job for any company and they wanted me to start a new project and that required me to gain a certification of some kind, I would be, I typically, I would be sent to take those certification certification classes either on company time mm-hmm. or I would be compensated for the money I spent procuring said certification yeah. at minimum, right? So I don't understand. Well, I mean, I do understand it's because <laughs> we've all been willing to do it, but I don't understand logically why that would not apply to the fitness industry. Like if you want me to teach a body pump class, I have to be body pump certified. So why then am I paying for that when you, when the gym is the one who then gets to advertise that they have body pump on their schedule? (laughs) Like I, I don't. And then for, for, 
you know, and again, I'm getting into the weeds of group fitness, but then you're paying for it with something like body pump and Zumba and all of these, you know, licensed programs, you're paying quarterly or monthly, or, you know, the instructor is paying ongoing. It's not just a one-time like, oh, I went and got certified and I'm done. It's an ongoing expense. And I have only ever heard of one company that that um, reimbursed for those expenses. And it was only because the states that that company was in required it by law. And when the company expanded beyond those states, it made sure that it did not carry, that did not carry over to the instructors in the states where it wasn't legally. <laughs> I, I, it just, I, I feel like at this point, the gyms go above and beyond If you want to talk controversial, like I'm about to say, you can cut this out if you want to. But I think honestly, at this point, they go above and beyond to save every possible dollar when it comes to their own employees. Mm -hmm. And it's it makes me sad. Yeah, I I agree. I really do agree. Um, I don't think that's controversial. I think that's things that many instructors face on a weekly basis. They see it. These are the conversations that employees have between each other like oh why are we why are we shorting on this why aren't we having this being fixed why aren't we getting paid for this holiday and i remember years ago and i mean these were topics that got brought up when i was just entering in to personal training my first four years being a personal trainer these were some of the things the holidays full-time part-time benefits these were topics back then that they're still around. These are still being discussed. They're not, there's no solution for them. These are still being discussed, argued, and yet instructors are still seeing the short end of it. And I mean, those are things that I feel like hurt the creativity, the growth of some instructors, because they are having to worry about these things that other industries uh, are not, or that they've already had solved, or they already have some, I don't want to say solved, they have some plan in place. Sure, yeah, they made progress. Exactly. Made progress. And yet we, I'm talking 10 years, 10, 12 years ago when I remember these conversations and trainer meetings on a Friday and they're still coming around. So, yeah. oh, it's a tough one. But uh, right now, I like I said, I think we do need to set up a second time because this is such a great topic and we only got to about half of what we wanted to, but we're going to get to the podcast takeaways here, okay. Kate. And uh, with this one, of course, I feel like everybody listening that follows the podcast is going to know that Kate shares a great perspective, a different perspective than every guest. And that's the beauty of this question. So Kate, what are three myths about the fitness industry? So I would say um, the first one I kind of touched on earlier in the podcast, that the first myth is that fitness employees aren't professionals. That we don't deserve to make a living or get benefits because we're like chasing our passion or we do it because we love it. Mm -hmm. Um, And and honestly, some of the worst of that comes from right inside the industry. It's people standing right next to you going like, oh, it's just my second job. Like, oh, I just I'm happy to break even. And and we that's that's a I think. There, there are lots of people who love their jobs and they still make money at them. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know why we, we don't think we can do both. Yeah. Um, so that would be my first one. Um, my second one, and I say this with all the love in my heart, is that it is a myth that personal trainers have more knowledge than group fitness instructors. You want to expand a, on that one? <laughs> because I find that very often people who work in the training department – have only ever solely worked in the training department and you've done both yep. correct yep so so you probably can and can speak to this i can they say you know they sort of look down on group fitness instructors like we're just the you know silly <laughs> as if it's you know jane fonda as yeah. you know i'm wearing a leotard and and leg warmers and you know and even if that were the case jane fonda built an empire so yep. let's not look down on that but um you know, there's a there's a, a a sneaking underlying score that personal trainers have so much more anatomy and physiology and ap- applicable knowledge than group fitness instructors. And I would argue that really it has far more to do with experience and far more to do with the amount of um, of what's the word I want. Uh, I think you enthusiasm you yeah. have for your craft, yep. how much I, you want to learn, how much you want to get better. Yep. Um, 
So, so that's, that's one. And then the last one I also touched on in this is that in a big box gym chain, that group fitness doesn't air quotes, make money and can't make money, <laughs> that it is a free service because I would, if anybody out there would like to hire me as a consultant, I will give you so many ways <laughs> that you could make money through your group fitness department. And I've done it. I have proven it to be true. So um, you hire the right per people, you know, I mean, you can, you've seen people can make money off of really ridiculous ideas. And this isn't even a ridiculous idea. It is a yep. very strongly held proposition and there isn't a single gym chain. I, I don't think out there that is really harnessing it for what it's value. Agree. Agree. The, the one I'll chime in on the second one with the group X versus personal training. And I think you are spot on with the, um, the that experience and understanding that you need, do need to get more after because, uh, from my perspective, having worked on the education side, I will say I know that what goes into a Group X manual and a PT manual. Um, I've also had to deal with the accreditation side, so pretty well equipped uh, to speak on the topic. And I will say that they're both entry level certifications. Right. Entry. That's what they are. They both yeah. have 20 pages of textbooks. Some as someone that I do have advanced degrees, and I will say these are fractions, very small fractions of what you can learn about these topics. Yeah, it's so a to say that, point. yeah. So to say that one knows more than the other, it's just it's just false, in my opinion, it, or in truth, to be honest. It's it, and exactly what you said that with experience, with the understanding to improve your craft, all those things help further and can. I mean, that's where you could potentially create a debate, but I don't see the need for it. But that would be that I feel like that's the great answer for it. So, Kate, before we sign off here, can you provide your website, social media, any upcoming events that you have? Absolutely. So um, my company, our company is Engage Fitness Collective. So you can find us at engagefitness.org. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Engage Fitness Collective, all three words. Um, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me personally, um, it's team at Engage Fitness. Dot org And honestly, I know that there are a lot of fitness professionals out there listening to this podcast. And, um, and, and thank you, Tyler, because I've listened to previous episodes where you've talked about the value of group fitness and how mm -hmm. you became a group fitness instructor to help you build your clientele for yeah. personal training, which is a whole nother episode we could do on just yep. that alone. But um, I really encourage you, please reach out to me. I, I, I have spent the last two and a half years building an online fitness business that is thriving and succeeding and not just financially, but creating community for people. Um, and I, it can be done. I know it seems daunting. I know it's not the set of skills it's I, that you thought you were getting into, but that's, I really honestly believe that it's, it's not at this point about competition. Yep. I'm not worried about competing. I'm worried about about where our industry is headed and I want to collaborate. So please, please engagefitness.org. Come visit us, check us out, um, tell people about us. And thank you, Tyler, so much for this opportunity. Great stuff this episode. We'll need to connect on a second episode, talk about more of these items and hopefully empower instructors to take those steps. Great stuff, Kate. Thank you so much. <laughs>